Um, so thank you very much. Um, my name is Maria Boyce. I worked here in the department for um, since from 2009 to 2014. So I know a few of the faces, but there's new faces since. Um, so would you just mind introducing yourselves and saying like where you are, what stage you're at, just so I kind of know how to focus this chat, I suppose, as we go along, if you don't mind. You can just say whether you're doing a PhD or working as a researcher or, or if, you know, you can tell a little my, bit about... My name is Grant I'm a careers advisor with the UC Career Service. Okay, right. I have a particular interest in economics. Okay. So that you background with economics. Okay, right. Okay, great, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, right. So is it a postdoc you're you're doing over as well or yeah. Okay, great. Okay, great. Siobhan Boyle, I'm a research Okay, all oh, right, great. I'm Connor Foley and I replaced you on the same <laughs> <laughs> I left you with all the, that data to go through, yeah. Uh, Mark Dabbert, full stop. Uh, I'm Kate Leal and I'm a PhD student in the department. Okay, great. <clears throat> so um, I was asked to give a, a presentation on career pathways, so I've just kind of focused it on my own journey up to, you know, so far. Um, so I'm going to. Um, Maybe I suppose for you, instead of me being up here talking about my experience, maybe if you use the time to reflect on your own circumstance and um, maybe the aim of it, to think about the roles you've worked on and what kind of experience you've built um, built up to date, I suppose. Um, and we'll have a little discussion at the end if people have questions or whatever. If you want to stop me any at any stage, just just do that. Um, so. So just the format, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about my own, my own career background. Um, just I'll give a few examples of projects that I've worked on and instead of focusing on the findings, which we normally do, I'll just focus on the skills that I learned throughout um, my work experience. I'll give a little detail on my PhD research and the skills I learned throughout that process. Um, and again, we'll have discussions or, and talk about tips or advice that people may have um, at, the, at the end. So this is a little bit of my background. Um, I suppose my research um, career started, um, I did a master's in economics here in UCC, um, focusing on health and evaluation studies. Um, and I suppose throughout the summer doing my thesis, I really enjoyed the, the process of doing the research and I kind of figured out that that's where I wanted to focus my career. Um, and I was lucky enough to get a position with um, ISQSH then for the Irish Society for quality and safety in healthcare. Um, and why I say I'm lucky enough, there was just very little opportunities when I finished my, my master's. And, and you know, even still, the, I suppose this is an area um, that's evolving in Ireland. And if we compare it to the likes of the UK or um, America or, or Canada or Australia, there seems to be a lot more opportunities in the area of healthcare research or health services research. Um, and I was also very lucky to have a really good mentor as a boss in the time that I worked with ISQSH and she really helped me develop my, my skills and my research skills and professionally, I suppose, my professional development. Um, and she gave me a lot of, I suppose, opportunities and responsibility at a really early stage in my career, which helped me to build, I suppose, the foundations for, you know, going on to get onto the Scholars Programme um, and get into, you know, it was such a competitive programme. I, I had that background, I suppose, which helped me to get into it. Um, and I suppose I, I thrived in that environment where I had the, you know, the opportunity to develop my skills and had the, I suppose, responsibility as well. And after a year, I was promoted to, I started as a research assistant and I was promoted to a research officer. Um, so I spent almost three years with ISQSH um, and I went on then to work in, to get a place in the Scholars Programme. Um, as you all know, it's a really good programme. Um, not only do you have the the thought element um, in the first year of the program, the, all the core modules, but you have the benefit of having peer learning because you start with a group of, of students and you move through um, the program together. So you're all going through, even though you're working on different projects, you're going through a lot of the same um, 
processes and learning the same skills so you can help each other a lot. And you also have the, I suppose, accessibility to some of the top academics in the area of health service research or all the different disciplines that make up health services research, um, which is a really invaluable um, resource when you're going through your PhD. Um, so after my PhD, I uh, got a postdoc position here in the department on the SIREN project. Um, and then I suppose I was faced with one of these crossroads in your career where you have to decide. I got um, an opportunity to work as a clinical audit analyst in the Bond Secures Hospital and I had to decide am I going to stay in the career, you know, in the academic setting or will I move to the hospital setting. Um, and I suppose two, there was two factors that helped me to, to decide. I felt like um, I'd never worked in a hospital setting and I was doing health services research um, and I... I always felt, I suppose, a little bit of a fraud that I, I'd never worked in that setting and didn't know, you know, the culture, the dynamics between healthcare professionals or how patients move through the system or even to know about the information sources, how the information is collected and what type of data you have, you know, at your disposal when you work in a hospital. So that was one decision. I just wanted to get that experience of working in that setting. Um, and the other was, I suppose, I do have a passion for my research interest is kind of quality improvement and I felt like it would be a great opportunity to work in a practical setting where I was looking at data. Um, you know, I believe in the, the idea that you cannot manage what you do not measure. So, you know, being in that setting where I was able to um, collect data and, and use that data to implement change. Um, so I'm just after getting a new um, opportunity, I suppose I've got a job with HICWA and starting in two weeks' time um, as a health information programme coordinator. It's in the health information directorate. So um, the focus of the role will be to, um, I, going back to, I suppose, what I did my PhD on and worked in ISQSH and, and I suppose even through SIREN, looking at performance indicators. Um, and I think the role will be around looking what data is available in Ireland and how we're going to move forward, you know, improving data quality, that it'll be at such a level that we can go to publicly reporting and go down that line. So um, so that's just a recap on my work experience. Um, again, what I'll do from now on is I'll um, go through some of the, the projects that I've worked on and, and focus on the skills that I learned throughout each role. So um, in ISQSH, I suppose I was primarily working on two projects. One was let, Let's Talk Medication Safety, and the other was um, a patient perception, and uh, national patient perception or patient satisfaction um, uh, questionnaire. And what we were doing was building um, software, or the project aimed to build software which could geographically map patient satisfaction across the different hospitals in Ireland. Um, but I suppose I'll just give you a little background to Let's Talk Medication Safety. Um, the aim of this was to to um, develop a patient empowerment tool which would help patients manage their medica medica medication safely. Um, and my role, I was tasked, I suppose, with undertaking the research. Um, we had a bit of a blank canvas, so we didn't um, know how we'd focus the information or fo focus the content or what audience we would focus, focus the um, publication at. So I did research around, I did um, key informant interviews with experts in the area of medication safety. I did um, focus groups with patients and the public. Um, and then I collated that information and I was, I also was tasked with organizing a, a steering group. So they were, again, experts in the area of medication safety who would decide on, you know, the content and the focus of this publication. Um, so once I'd done the primary research, I um, presented this back to the steering group and we had lots of meetings around um, developing the content of this booklet and designing the booklet. Um, we got a graphic designer and we got a cartoonist to de develop cartoons around kind of ideas within the booklet. Um, and then we uh, piloted the, the booklet. We did more focus groups um, and a questionnaire with healthcare professionals and um, then went through the drafting process again until everyone was happy with the publication. Um, and it was very it was quite simple, you know, it was um, just giving tips on how to manage your medication safely. We focused, um, we figured out that instead of, you know, we were wondering, would we focus on 
a high risk medications or a high risk population or just the general public but what we decided to do in the end was focus the publication to help people moving um, between healthcare settings so if you were primary care and going into hospital um, the questions that you could a should ask about your medicines you know for example have you been prescribed new medicines or is it just a generic brand of the medicine you were in before you come in you know these kind of issues so um, it was distributed to every pharmacy in Ireland and all the public hospitals so it got a, a wide range of um, I suppose the dissemination of it went throughout all the healthcare settings um, we uh, got we were a finalist in the uh, National Adult Literacy Health um, Literacy Awards, and we were, got a finalist in the Aramac Health Innovation Awards with this publication. So um, it, it was all the the work went to good use, I suppose, in the end. Um, so that was one project I worked on. I, as I said, I was working also on a patient perception National Patient Perception Survey. So I got my first. Um, I suppose experience with doing qualitative in, um, qualitative research, so interviews and focus groups. Um, I was doing quantitative analysis on the surveys because they'd done previous surveys as well. So we were constantly, you know, going into the data to ask questions there. Um, I developed my scientific writing and grant writing further. We were a non-for-profit organisation, so we were continuously looking for grants in um, areas to bring in more, more money to keep you know, staff um, doing research and education and training. Um, developed my presentation skills. I got my first um, opportunity to present at national, international conferences. Uh, project management, like the likes of Let's Talk Medication Safety, I managed that project from start to completion. Um, coordination of the likes of the steering groups, and we did a lot of education and training in hospitals. Um, and we organise a national um, uh, healthcare conference as well. So, um, and networking also was a big part of this role because again we were a non-for-profit organisation and we used to get in funding. We constantly had to promote the work we were doing. Um, so on to my my PhD. Um, I my supervisor for my PhD was. Um, Professor John Brown and uh, I suppose my background, you know, my research interests had developed through the work in ISQSH. Um, I was interested in quality improvement in using patients, um, patient involvement to improve quality um, and John's background was in the area of PROMS which stands for Patient Reported Outcome Measures. So we designed a research around looking at the value of using PROMS as quality improvement tools. So the rationale for this, it was, um, when I say quality improvement tools, PROMs were initially developed um, for the likes of um, clinical trials where they were looking at the effectiveness of, um, you know, treatments or, or different um, drugs. Um, but um, the use of PROMs as a quality improvement tool, I suppose, began in the, the 90s where um, people were collecting the information and feeding it back to professionals in order to kind of promote a change in how they were managing patients. Um, so they were traditionally again used at kind of an individual level where a patient would complete a questionnaire, for example, um, the Oxford HIP score, and the, that would then be presented to a consultant, and they'd have that information before you go in to see them, and so it improved like patient management and communication. Um, but the NHS in England started using PROMS at a group level as a performance measurement tool, so they'd collect. Um, so the Oxford HIP score from all patients undergoing hip replacement surgery before their operation and then again six months after their operation and they were able to get a change score and aggregate these change scores to the level of the surgeon or the, the hospital and use this information to look at performance. So it was quite a novel way to use PROMS but there was very little evidence on the effectiveness of using, using this information and of course the NHS were spending and still are spending millions on this this program. So um, and other countries were starting to become interested in in this use of PROMS as well. So the research looked at um, the effectiveness. I suppose the rationale for the PROMS program is that by using benchmarking and the public release of data and pay for performance, that it would improve the um, the outcomes of patients and it would shift the distribution to the right. So there would be you know, better standard of care, I suppose, across the board. Um, so the research involved doing four um, <coughs> research studies. There was 
two systematic reviews, a randomized controlled trial, and a qualitative um, study. Uh, so the first systematic review looked at the quantitative evidence. Um, again, because this was a novel use of PROMS, there was very, uh, when I did a kind of a scoping exercise, I found that there was quite um, little evidence in this area. So then I decided to do a systematic review to if, investigate the effectiveness of PROMS given their different functions, so be it at the patient level or at the group level as a performance measurement tool. Um, and uh, I suppose doing a systematic review was new to me. I'd never done one before, so, um, and I, I suppose I had to learn all the skills as, uh, along the way, so from developing the research question to developing the search strategy, doing the search, um, searching, screening all the papers, identifying the papers that would be included in the review, um, extracting relevant information, critically appraising the papers, um, and then synthesizing the information and, and publishing it. So it was a, quite a steep learning curve throughout the process. So when I got to the second systematic review, I decided to do a second one because we knew there was qualitative evidence to um, based on healthcare professionals' experiences of using PROMS as a quality improvement tool. So I did a systematic review to, um, to uh, report the, the, the findings. Um, again, I'd done one systematic review, so the second one was a little easier, and I had little tips that I had learned along the way to um, make some of the, the processes, a little, processes a little easier. Um, and after the two systematic reviews, um, I think we only I've only found one study in the first systematic review that used PROMS as a performance measurement tool, and two in this review. So we knew there was literally no there wasn't an evidence base out there. So I designed um, a randomised control trial to look at the um, effectiveness of feeding back peer benchmark PROMS feedback to orthopaedic surgeons here in Ireland. Um, so we designed ma and I managed every step of the process again from recruiting surgeons nationally, we recruited, um, we needed high volume surgeons um, because we had to benchmark their performance, they had to have a certain amount of uh, procedures in order to accurately benchmark their performance. Um, so we got all 35 surgeons in Ireland um, on board and then 21 of those had enough, um, had a high enough volumes to benchmark them and they went into the trial. Um, I had to get ethics approval in um, 16 hospitals in Ireland. I had to go to 13 ethics committees. Um, we, I, what else, um, involved oh, training all the data collectors in each of the hospitals. Um, then following up with patients six months later, so I had to track recruitment and then track six months post-op and send out a questionnaire to get the follow-up with each patient. Um, I all, in, in total, I had 1,600 patients, so there was a lot of following up. Um, I coded all the pre-op, post-op questionnaires, um, cleaned the database, did all the analysis, and then um, provided the intervention to the surgeons and developed the intervention, which was a peer benchmark um, feedback report and an educational session, and then did the analysis and publication process also. Um, so we found that there was little impact on, on outcomes across patients in the control arm versus the intervention arm. Um, so it, it seemed to have little impact on surgeons' behaviour. So we did a qualitative study to figure out you know, why this was. And, um, so we examined the surgeons in the intervention group, um, the, the reactions to the problems feedback. Um, and this was very interesting, actually, because when I started the process of doing the randomised control trial and recruiting surgeons, I thought I'd have a real problem getting surgeons to sign up to this because there, I suppose there wasn't a culture of collecting outcome data in Ireland and these surgeons had never seen their their outcomes benchmarked against their peers, so I thought they'd kind of shy away from it. But actually, they were really inter interested to get involved because I suppose they're quite a competitive bunch and they all want to improve professionally, so they wanted to see how they were doing in comparison to the other surgeons. Um, so the interviews were very interesting. Um, I was basically after giving surgeons a feedback report which told them they were either the worst or the best or average, you know, in comparing, comparison to the national average and then in comparison to the other 20 surgeons in the trial. 
Um, so the interviews um, looked at um, how they valued this information, how they valued patient reported outcome measures, um, and um, we the results, I suppose, helped explain why there was no impact. And there's a lot of issues around conceptual issues. Surgeons had never seen this type of data before. Um, they were used to outcome measures, but not outcome measures that had been reported by patients. So, you know, there's whole issues, the methodological issues around do they trust the data and how do they interpret the data. There's, um, I suppose, a lot of training in knowing how to analyse the data and interpret it. So, um, I suppose they were the kind of outcomes that came out of it that, that we need more support um, at a ground level in order to use this type of data. Um, so the skills that I developed throughout my PhD, I suppose a PhD you're in an academic setting and you're, you're here to learn, so it, you know the nature of it, it's a very fast learning pace and when you leave academia and go into other areas, you know, you're always learning within a job, but you're never going to learn at the rate you are at the moment. So use all the resources around you and, and gain as many skills as you can. Um, you'll see the list. I've kind of spoke, you know, went through a lot of these anyway, but some of the skills that I learned through this process, um, you'll see them there. So um, then I went on to do a postdoc position here in the department on SIREN, which um, is a a research study, it's um, across a number of universities to look at the impact of the reconfiguration of urgent and emergency care in Ireland. Um, I was involved in two work packages, one which looked at patient perceptions of urgent and emergency care and the other was um, doing interview with key stakeholders to figure out how care was currently being delivered in each region and any change that may have happened and how this impacted on the <coughs> delivery of care. So um, I think in total was there 180, 190 interviews in total, um, nearly 200. I think I did around 80 of those. Um, so it was very interesting. It gave me a real um, understanding of uh, how our health system works, the different models of care in each region, um, and I suppose a lot of the problems with our system as well. Um, and again, I developed my skills further. Um, you know, I, I don't think, you know, doing 80 interviews is a really large qualitative study, so it was great to get that experience of doing that many interviews, um, managing such large quantities of data, your project time management, um, recruiting. I think they did those 80 interviews over a year and recruiting, identifying potential um, candidates, recruiting them, and then organising to be a at every corner of the country, you know, it involves not only time management but bu budget management because there's no point driving up to Donegal doing one interview. You need to try and schedule a few if you're driving up that kind of distance. Um, and of course, you're al always in every role you're developing your communication skills further. Um, so, my role in the Bond Secures Hospital um, was to um, support and develop audit and research capabilities within the hospital. Um, I suppose at any one time I could have been managing, you know, 40 different projects um, to different degrees. I could have been um, just advising on projects or, you know, actually completing the data collection and analysis and write up for the projects. Um, so there was always a lot going on there. Um, uh, so just in regards to, I'll give you one example of a project I worked on there, just to give you an example of the kind of work I, I did. Um, the sepsis program, we introduced a sepsis screening and management program in, in the Bond Secures Hospital. Um, we adapted the HSC sepsis screening form. We modified it because we wanted to collect additional data uh, to help us manage care. Um, so what would happen on the wards, the nurses would um, identify a pa patient that had potentially um, sepsis and they would ring a doctor to do a review on the patient. Um, and when they did, they'd start the screening form which looked at their, their clinical indicators at the moment to figure out whether they had sepsis. And if they had sepsis, they'd open what we call the sepsis 6 bundle. Um, sepsis is a very serious condition and it's time dependent. Um, so they had to open and complete the bundle within an hour because patients can deteriorate very quickly and end up in ICU. So um, we, once the doctors had completed the sepsis screening form, 
they'd return one form back to me in best practice for coding and analysis and the other would go into the medical records. And I'd do quite detailed analysis. We had lots of data um, and report this back to a working group quarterly um, and this would help, um, I suppose, direct any improvements that we'd make in, in the system. Um, this is a very, it was a quite, we'd, um, we used to put a lot of work or do put a lot of work into this um, screening and management program and uh, this, the National Sepsis um, program came to some of the leaders and that came to visit us last year and they couldn't get over the amount of work we were doing and the amount of data and the detail of, of the data that we had and how, how we were managing care. And the key to the success of this um, was the consultant microbiologist, Dr. Olive Murphy. She put huge amounts of time into continuously training on the wards, continuously checking to see if the sepsis um, screening tool was completed because if you don't have an accurate picture of what's going on in the wards, you know, if your data isn't reliable, there's no point collecting it in the first place. So she used to retrospectively complete forms which weren't fully um, or completed fu fully or hadn't been started in the first place. Um, and it gave us a, a really good database then to to manage uh, care. Uh, this is just a little bit about sepsis. Um, in order to have be diagnosed with sepsis, you need to have at least two SIRS um, symptoms and infection. So you'll see the SIRS symptoms. So if you've a high respiratory rate and heart rate, for example, and infection, you're diagnosed with having sepsis. And this is a sepsis bundle then. Within an hour, the doctors had to uh, take blood cultures, get lactate and FBC, um, do urine output monitoring, give O2, give IV fluid resuscitation, resuscitation and give antibiotics. Um, because what happens with sepsis is the organs start failing, so this is um, very important to, to get this within the hour. Uh, this was the screening form. We modified, this is the HSE one, we just modified it to collect additional information about the source of infection so we could figure out where and what type of patients were going on to have sepsis and um, the type of antibiotic that they were given just so we could monitor that to see if they were given the appropriate type of antibiotic. Um, a lot of work going into audit feedback, education and reminders, um, having good quality data. We did a lot of validation in our database, trying to get our database complete so any patients that have se had sepsis. So just to give you an indication, when I arrived first, there was 40 patients in the sepsis database from the previous year and there's now around 40 a month. So like there's a, a lot of activity there. Um, so we now have a really good indication of what's going on there. Um, the data is of good quality. We do lots of validation. So checking it against say patients in the lab that had positive blood cultures, we were able to check to see if they were in the sepsis database. Um, and I suppose we have reliable data now to drive improvements. Um, and Olive was always education. She does induction with all new doctors and educates continuously on the wards. So um, she gets a lot of credit for this program. Uh, so the skills I've learned in this role, um, so it was a support role. So I gave a lot of advice on methodologies, on collecting data and um, managing database so I didn't do all the data collection and managing the databases I tried to educate people staff and the wards that would be able to do it themselves and then if they needed um, uh, help with the analysis or whatever they'd come to me because I was the only one that had data in the hospital I did a lot of the analysis and how to interpret the findings um, I sat on the ethics committee for the group of the hospital so I reviewed all research applications that came in um, and gave, gave feedback on those um, the role involved a lot of coordination, so managing projects and quality improvement projects, um, and again communication. So on to my last role is what I'm going to be starting in HICWA, the Health Information Programme Coordinator role. I'll be starting there in two weeks. And I've told you a little bit about this. It will um, be to develop uh, recommendations around how performance or indicator data is shared and reported in Ireland and to drive improvements in the way the information is governed. So it's basically trying to get better quality data. So if you want to just take a moment um, and just think about your own situation and your own, maybe have a clear career pathway in mind, one that you would like to follow. Maybe you're open to you know opportunities that may come up um, or 
maybe are a bit apprehensive, you know, about the, you know, what opportunities there will be um, in the future. I know when I was coming to the end of my PhD, I was apprehensive. I was wondering, you know, will I have a job, you know, after doing all this work? Will I, you know, and how long will it be before I get a job? So just have a think about your own circumstance. And I'll tell you a little bit about where po past students have, are currently working in the, through the uh, SPHERE programme. So um, this is the current um, enrolment for the Scholars Programme or the Sphere Programme. Um, there's currently 48 students registered, uh, 36 have completed their PhD and graduated. Um, so out of those 36, this is where people have ended up. There's 19 in postdoctoral positions. Um, there's seven in other kind of non-specific research roles four working in policy or research roles within the public sector, three in the private sector, two in lectureships, and one um, clinical research role. So this actually surprised me. I contacted Sphere during the week to get this data. Um, I actually thought there'd be more people working in the actual health service. You'll see there's only four. Now, obviously, people are a lot, it's academia, so there, it's a good, there is going to be a lot of people in postdoc positions. Um, but I know out of those four, two, at least two of them were already in those roles before they even started their PhD. So um, it just shows there isn't actually many coming out the other end choosing to work in, in the health service. Or maybe it's that the opportunities are limited, I'm not sure. Um, so factors co to consider when you are, um, you know, trying to choose what career pathway you go into, you know, there's... Your qualification skills and interests are constantly evolving and it will, I suppose, dictate where you'd be targeting your career. Um, values, motivations, personality, location, maybe flexible or not, you know, are you flexible enough to move to the UK or Australia or Canada in the morning? If so, you'll have a, a better range of opportunities, whereas if um, you're a bit more... Um, stuck to a location due to family or whatever personal circumstances personality may decide whether you want to go into something like lecturing or a uh, research role or maybe work in the community um, with um, you know public public health or something a role like that so uh, the choice of areas you could go into academia uh, the public sector so the likes of HICWA, HSC, Department of Health, ESRI Central Statistics Office, I know they were kind of all areas where I would have had an eye on um, potential opportunities. Um, private sector, pharma, public hospitals, insurance, you know, they all would, um, would like kind of the skills that we're currently learning through research, skill, you know, through the PhD programs or postdocs, uh, whatever you may be currently doing. Um, and then there's an other area like semi-state NGOs, um, who are also always looking for researchers as well. So um, it just depends kind of where you'd like to end up and I suppose and what opportunities may arise also. So when you're applying for different jobs, a lot of you know this anyway, but just um, you need to demonstrate your core competencies. So your knowledge, experience, project management, communication, analytical skills, critical thinking, time management, and maybe human resource management as well. So try and think about that as you're going through and try to continuously develop these skills and if you have opportunities to get involved in projects at this level take it because you know it'll stand to you when you're applying for jobs and you'll have examples of, of um, all your different competencies. Also always track your outcomes so all the projects you've worked on, papers you've written, maybe reports you've written, grants you've applied for or, or been um, successful with, presentations and awards and I think you know you'd think, oh sure, I'd remember all that anyway, but as you go on and the more presentations and things like that you do, you do kind of, if you don't keep track of them, you will forget about some of them. So just keep an Excel sheet or whatever and, 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 and keep um, a track of them. Uh, when applying for jobs, always focus your CV or application for each role. So even though the roles might be similar, they might be looking for different things. So don't just fire off the same application to each one. Spend time and, you know, um, do spend time writing your application. I know for the HICWA job, I spent ages writing the, the application, the one I was just successful with, because um, 
you know, that, that's the first thing they're going to give an eye over. And if you just throw in something, they're, they're going through hundreds of these. So you need to have it focused and concise and you need to sell yourself. Uh, prepare well for your for an interview. Uh, I suppose this goes without saying, but if you think about it, any interview I've done, I've been probably asked 10 questions in different ways. So you can have your answers prepared for, for each of those 10 questions. They're going to ask you the same thing, but in a different way. And you can be able to, you know, you can have a very clear answer, concise answer, and it will prevent you waffling. Um, and also always prepare for an interview. Get someone to sit down with you, ask you the questions. Um, it's hard work, but it pays off in the end, I suppose. Uh, some tips, I suppose, at this stage. Um, never stop in any role, never stop learning. I know when I moved from academia into working in the health service, you know, it is a different pace. The learning is, you're at a different level. And uh, every project I worked on, or, you know, every now and again, I'd f kind of sit back and go, all right, is this worth doing? Is there, for, for quality improvement, is it improving anything? And what kind of skills am I learning out of it? Or am I just doing this for the sake of it? You know, you do need to constantly assess what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, learn from each other. I suppose when we were doing our PhD, I had a lot of friends in the department here. And we always um, learned from each other. We always helped each other. We got involved in each other's projects. We did second reviewing for for systematic reviews or for qualitative research and it not only benefits them but it benefits you because you're gaining new skills. Do all the additional modules, there's postgraduate modules here in UCC, do as many of them as you can because they're free when you're doing a PhD. Um, you'll want to do them when you leave and you'll have to pay for them so try and do as many of them as you want as you can. Um, always improve your core skills and identify your weaknesses and try and focus on, on those. Um, for your work experience, think ahead. I did my work experience in HICWA. Now, it wasn't, folk, it wasn't in relation to my PhD project, but I got experience working with HICWA, and I, I always had a, a kind of an eye on, uh, on the work there. I think they do, um, you know, they're quite progressive and dynamic, and I had, um, I suppose, an eye on them since I did my work experience there. Uh, and enjoy the experience. You'll, as you know, you would make lots of friends. And, um, so, um, do any of you have any questions or anything you'd like to discuss after that?